Hello, everyone, and welcome to this fourth edition of the Swiss Next Next Frontier webinar series, which will be held on a topic which I think has fascinated pretty much everyone at some point in their lives, namely exoplanets, or in other words, planets that are outside our solar system. My name is Nils Feldman, and I am a project coordinator at Swiss Next in China, the Science Consulate of Switzerland in China. As part of the global Swiss Next Network, we aim to connect Switzerland to China and, of course, also the world in education, research, and innovation by supporting the outreach and active engagement of our partners in the international exchange of knowledge, ideas, and of course, also talent. Next Frontier is our latest webinar series, which spotlights cutting edge research in Switzerland and China with a focus on the Swiss National Centers of Competence in Research. Um, these are usually abbreviated as NCCRs, as well as leading research institutions in China. The aim is therefore to spark potential exchanges as well as future collaborations. Today, we are delighted and honored to be joined by four prominent speakers from the NCCR Planet S, the University of Bern, the University of Geneva, the Chinese Society of Space Research, as well as Sun Yat-sen University, who will provide us with an exclusive insight into the latest developments in the field of exoplanetary research, as well as offer a glimpse into these fascinating worlds beyond our solar system. Just a quick reminder before we start, we do have a Q&A function at the bottom of our Zoom interface. So if you have, if you have any questions, Please don't hesitate to just type them in there and we will get back to them at the end of the presentation. Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Nicholas Thomas. Professor Thomas is currently a professor of experimental physics at the University of Bern, as well as the principal investigator of the color and stereo surface imaging system. Professor Thomas graduated from the University of New York in 1986 before subsequently coming to Bern in 2003 where he specializes in developing remote sensing instruments for the detailed study of objects in our solar system. His main interests include comets, the moon of Jupiter, and Mars. In addition, Professor Thomas has also been the principal investigator or co-investigator on 10 instruments on NASA and ESA missions. Professor Thomas, the floor is yours. Okay. I'm unmuted. I will start sharing. And I'll ask the usual question, Niels, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this presentation. It's, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here, especially with uh, also with my colleagues here giving the presentation. It's really nice. Um, I'm going to be talking, I, I decided to take as my theme today, space instrumentation uh, within the exoplanet domain and within planetary sciences in general. And I'd like to begin, however, with an observation. And that is that the, the combination of ground-based work, numerical modeling, and space-borne investigations that have totally changed our perception of planetary formation and evolution within the past quarter of a century. Um, it's now known that uh, we, have, we have detected and discovered thousands of exoplanets orbiting other stars. And we now assume that there are billions of these planets orbiting stars in our galaxy. Now, the NCCR, the National Center for Competence in Research Planet S is at the forefront of this expanding field. And there's a wide range of activities that Planet S uh, 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 undertakes. But I'm going to make an observation here about how were exoplanets really first discovered? There were two real things that were important to the discovery of the first exoplanet. The first was having the foresight to appreciate that stars could be influenced by the planets moving around them uh, and producing motion in those stars. But the second thing that was really important was in the development of the instrumentation to make the observation that, uh, uh, to observe that motion. And that development of instrumentation was continuous, allowing Michel Maillard to make this first discovery. And it's the instrumentation development that I would like to talk about really today and with, with specific, uh, um, uh, with specific um, uh, uh, specifically with respect to space. And I'd like to begin uh, by looking at the, really the first scientific Swiss spacecraft uh, that was built in collaboration with the European Space Agency, and it was called KEOPS. Uh, and KEOPS was a unique mission. 
um, in that it brought together um, a relatively small country as, a, as an ESA member state, because Switzerland is smaller than, than Germany, France, Great Britain and Italy, um, but it brought, it brought the Swiss competence that, that uh, Switzerland had in exoplanetary research and brought it together with the capabilities of the European Space Agency to produce a small but very effective mission. And it was the first space mission that was dedicated to studying known exoplanets and effectively completing what we refer to as follow-up. Once an exoplanet had been detected, to use an instrument in space to characterize uh, that particular planet um, by measuring how uh, measuring the planet as it goes in transit in front of the star, looking how the light from the star would dip um, because of the planet obscuring the light from the star, and that way characterizing the radius and through the mass getting densities. Um, one could also use KEOPS to perform phase curve analyses as well. The instrument itself, it, what is it? Well, it's nothing else other really than a high precision space photometer. And it's capable of looking at one target at a time, but almost anywhere in the sky and making a program to look at any, any, uh, uh, any uh, object in the sky, any star in the sky. The mission has been active now for two years, uh, but there's an extension expected to be approved starting in 2023, taking us through until 2025, probably the end of 2025. Um, and we can observe with this instrument uh, uh, stars down to magnitude 12 or so uh, in the optical range. The instrument, instrument itself was mostly designed at the University of Bern, uh, but with contributions to the actual hardware from many places across Europe. Uh, the baffle, for example, came from Belgium. Um, and you can see the instrument here. Um, uh, it's a 32 centimeter diameter telescope. So this is quite a sizable, sizable primary mirror and bringing light from uh, the aperture um, through, a, through some baffling, uh, two mirrors with a fold mirror onto a CCD detector in the focal plane. Um, the whole instrument was developed and built in the space of about five years. And uh, as I said, and, uh, as I already noted, launched uh, in, uh, just over two years ago. This is an example of some of the photometry that it can perform. This is a new two loopy. Uh, and this, uh, this, uh, the instrument was used to detect a third planet um, orbiting, this, uh, orbiting this particular star. Two, uh, two planets have previously been discovered by the American test spacecraft. Uh, Monica Lendl will be talking much more about the KEOPS results uh, uh, a little bit later in the webinar. However, I also now want to talk about developments and what's looking, how we're looking to, to look at exoplanets in the future. One of the things in which we're involved in in Switzerland is PLATA. Um, it's the Mission Planetary Transits and Oscillations of Stars. It's a European Space Agency mission, but in this case, it's being led by DLR in Berlin. DLR um, is, a, is, a, is a frequent partner institute of the University of Bern for space instrumentation development. PLATO has um, 26 telescopes observing a larger field in the sky and attempts to observe star, uh, planets in transit going in front of stars. The idea is that you can observe as many as one million stars at a time to discover and characterize um, rocky exosolar planets. The emphasis here, however, is on studying Earth-like planets and particularly those that are in what we refer to as the habitable zone um, around sun-like stars where liquid water can exist. In other words, we're going after planets that are not too hot, not too close to the sun, not too close to the star, planets that are not too far away so that they're cold, they're in this Goldilocks regime where, uh, where there is the possibility of liquid water. And liquid water is thought to be a precursor for life, of course. We're now at the moment producing the flight model hardware for uh, as the University of Bern's contribution to PLATA. And in fact, I've got a couple of pictures of this. Um, here are some tubes that will be used to uh, support the optics for these telescopes for PLATA. Um, they're currently, these are four flight model tubes. They were delivered at the beginning of, uh, beginning of November. And they're here in one of our thermal vacuum chambers 
getting ready to bake out. Um, bake out, what is that? Well, it's trying to get rid of all of the um, all of the all of the uh, gases that could potentially sublime from the uh, from these materials, so that they don't condense over all of the optics. There are still twenty flight models and three flight spares to be delivered by the end of uh, by the end of twenty twenty two, and uh, so that's uh, one of the major activities that we're doing in the next uh, year to eighteen months. It's also important to recognize that when we're doing exoplanet research, it's important to think about how that relates to solar system objects. And one of the solar system objects that we're, we're very interested in is Mercury. Now, why is this? Well, Mercury is an end member in our own solar system. It's the, the planet that is closest to our sun. And it acts in some ways as a, as a means of testing um, some of our models of exoplanet formation and evolution. Um, and it's in part because it's a terrestrial planet with the best preserved surface properties that we have. The atmospheres of Venus, the Earth and Mars have all disturbed the surfaces of our planet, of these, of these planets. Mercury is effectively uh, preserved in this respect. It also has an unusual magnetic field and unusual geophysics. And so one of the questions that we ask is, can Mercury tell us more about terrestrial planet formation and evolution processes? Um, we're involved at the University of Bern um, in a mission called Bepi Columba, which is currently on its way to Mercury with trying to test theories that were even developed by the current present leader of NCCR planets, Willie Benz. He published a theoretical study on why Mercury is unusual in 1988. Just goes to show how long it can take sometimes to test theories. Um, uh, uh, the experiment that's been built for this mission that's come from Switzerland is the laser altimeter instrument. It's the first European laser altimeter that was built for interplanetary flight. And it's rather remarkable. The laser altimeter is here sitting on the spacecraft. It's this object here, this thing here, if you can, hopefully you can see my mouse, all right? And it's a 14 kilogram experiment consuming just 30 watts. And it's a, a very high precision design, uh, designed to cope with extremes of temperature that one experiences in Mercury. Um, the spacecraft has already been launched. It was launched on the, in 2018 from Kourou. And the instrument is functional with arrival for seen at Mercury in 2025. One of the other things that we're interested in in Planet S is to look at planetary formation processes and how these planets, these exoplanets have formed. One way of looking at this is to look at comets. Comets and planets have long been thought of as having an interrelated origin. And uh, they, so, we, we tend to think of comets as being protoplanetesimals, uh, objects that eventually, when some of them came together, they formed the cores of planets. And the presence of ices indicates that indeed these objects might be relics from solar system formation processes. So we've been particularly interested in the past in looking at comets through, for example, the Rosetta mission from the European Space Agency. Um, but we're now developing a new mission and, and uh, new instrumentation for a mission called Comet Interceptor. Now, Comet Interceptor is ESA's latest small mission. And the idea is that we go to um, a, a, a waiting point and we wait for a dynamically new comet or even an interstellar asteroid that enters our solar system and then we use the spacecraft to go and find it and go and get it. It's the very first time that we've ever launched a spacecraft without knowing its final target. It's quite remarkable. We're launching a spacecraft without knowing where ultimately it will go. The main imaging system is Swiss lead. And this is the design for this instrument that you can see here on this particular slide. And the idea is, can we place further constraints on the properties of planetesimals forming planets, or even capture a very first image 
of an interstellar asteroid. We know that these things exist. Two interstellar objects have already been observed in our solar system. This is an artist's impression of one of them, Oumuamua. But we would be able for the first time with this instrument, maybe to get a picture of one of these interstellar objects. Okay, I got three minutes. Um, I just wanted to show you this video because you might recognize from the previous slide here, the structure of the telescope. Well, that telescope is actually um, a follow-up of an instrument that's already flying. And it's this one here. Um, this is the Cassis instrument that is currently orbiting Mars. And I wanted to show this because it's a really cute video and shows you what we have to do for space instrumentation to make it suitable for flight. One of the things that we do is that we shake the hell out of these instruments in order to simulate a launch on a rocket. And here you can see an example of this. This is the Cassis instrument being shaken prior to launch. And it's a precursor of this comet interceptor camera system called COCA. So finally, I'd like to finish by looking right into the far future. The first exoplanet was discovered around about 26 years ago. This mission is what we foresee for 26 years time from today. It's a mission called LIFE. It's a large interferometer for studying exoplanets. And the idea is that it's a space-based interferometer for the detection of signatures of life. The aim behind this is clearly to investigate planetary atmospheres and to look and see whether we can really try to get signatures of life uh, from, uh, from uh, really from ground, from space-borne observations. And we're investing in Planet S into, um, into, this, into this particular mission. And the mission has become part of the Voyage 2050 program of the European Space Agency. Um, this contains, this uh, mission contains uh, this uh, Voyage 2050 program, suggests that we should have a large mission enabling characterization of atmosphere or temperature of temperate planets, exoplanets, and it should be a top priority for ESA within the Voyage 2050 timeframe. And Planet S, this RNCCR, is supporting this now for a possible launch around 2045. So I'll conclude by saying that space instrumentation is just one element of the program designed to study formation and evolution and habitability of planets. I've just had time to talk about that one thing, but we're interested in formation, characterization, habitability, and perhaps looking 25 years into the future, life on exoplanets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Thomas, for the very interesting talk. Now, I am delighted to introduce our second speaker, Professor Zi Wu. Professor Wu is the president of the Chinese Society of Space Research, as well as the former director general of the National Space Science Center of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He is moreover a full member of the International Aer Astronautics Academy, a fellow of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, a member of the Advisory Board for Space Resources of the Government of Luxembourg, as well as a member of the International Advisory Committee, Committee of the UAE Space Agency. Professor Wu has also held numerous prominent roles in numerous groundbreaking projects, such as being the project manager of the scientific payload system of the Chinese Lunar Exploration Programs, Chang'e 1, as well as 3, just to name a few. Professor Wu, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation by Swiss Next. So give me the chance to talk with the audience on uh, one of our program. So the topic of my talk is a habitable explanatory search by astronomy. Astronomy is, uh, is a new method to looking at, uh, looking for exoplanet. So I will come to that later. So as uh, Professor Thomas just said, uh, the discovery of the first exoplanet uh, was happened in 1995. 
by two uh, Swiss uh, scientists, uh, Mi Mi Michel Mayou and uh, DDI Quillo. So they use a ground uh, observatory, a telescope, looking at the star for a long time and found the vibration uh, generated, generated by the uh, Doppler shift. When the frequency, when the star is coming to you and the frequency goes high, and when it's going away from you, the frequency goes low. So they discovered the first X planet. Before that, uh, nobody believed there's an X planet. Solar system is so special. But in fact, solar system is not that special. We found more and more X planet. Uh, my top topic is more concentrated uh, on the looking for habitable planet, which means the planet has to be uh, within a certain distance uh, from the sun, from the home star. So I will come to that point uh, later. And uh, since then, there are more and more exoplanets has been discovered. For example, NASA Kepler mission has found uh, the first exoplanet within the habitable zone. It's called uh, Kepler 22b. And uh, it turned out it is in the habitable zone, uh, but the planet is so big, it's a Jupiter size. So if the planet is so big, uh, we can imagine how large the gravity is. And uh, uh, if there is a creature uh, on, 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 on the surface of the planet, it should be very small because the gravity is so, 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 so big. Huh? And later on, on 2012, NASA Kepler mission found another one. Uh, this is also very interesting because uh, this is a planet, uh, it's the most nearby. Uh, the star, the home star is called Alpha Centauri. It's just next to our sun, uh, which is a 4.2 light year away, which is the most close by star uh, from our sun. Uh, we found, they found there's a planet also rotating with the uh, Alpha Centauri B, uh, but it is so close to the star which means it's not in the habitable zone, it's so hot. And uh, later on, on 2013, 2014, there are more and more planets has been discovered, but all of them have some problem. They are not as same as our sun. So either it's too far away or either it is the same size, but uh, it is outside of the planet or even the home star is not as, as, as big as our sun is too, the temperature is too low is red door, so it's, it's different type of uh, stars, not uh, sun types uh, stars, uh, FKG type. So when we talk about uh, habitable zone, it means the, uh, like uh, Professor Thomas had just said, it means the liquid water can exist on the surface. Uh, if it's too cold, too cold, it will be frozen all the time. It, if it's too hot, the liquid water will be vibrate. So there will be no liquid water like uh, mercury. Uh, it's too, clo too close to our sun. So uh, another, uh, uh, another uh, very important uh, uh, factor for the habitable zone, uh, Earth-like planet, is it has to be a uh, uh, rocket planet. It's, it should not be uh, Jupiter size and also uh, 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 gas. Uh, full of gas planet. And it has to be had a solid surface like our Earth and with water on, on, on the surface. So it's called the uh, Earth's uh, brother or uh, habitable uh, Earth type uh, planet. So this is what we are looking for. How many of them in our universe? Many, many. So there's a Dirac equation telling us in our universe, there are two billions of them. And even with our galaxies, there are thousand, can be one thousand of them. So we have to uh, uh, look at that because it might be a, a life. There might be an exoplanet life on the surface. So the most interest, uh, uh, the the factor to us is to find an Earth type uh, planet and within the habitable zone, and the home star should be a sun type. So there are several kinds of technology and uh, Professor Thomas has just mentioned this, uh, uh, this uh, transit method. 
uh, which means if there is a planet, if you're looking at a star, a home star, and you found some deep, uh, some uh, uh, the, the light, the illumination of the light going down and going up again. And after 25 or, or certain number of days, it coming back again and it repeat all the time. So with that, we can, uh, we can uh, say that there's a planet rotating around the home star. And when the light is going down, uh, because of the, the planet uh, uh, just in between us and, and the home star, so the light will be uh, dimmed. Uh, this is called the transit method. And Kepler tests and uh, Kiops and uh, many other missions are using this technology. And another technology is called uh, uh, ratio uh, velocity, uh, which been, has been used by DDN and Mayo, Professor Mayo and Professor DDN Quillo. They are using uh, uh, the very sensitive uh, frequency um, optical telescope and measuring the changing of the frequency light, changing of the light frequency uh, when the star is going away, going, going towards you and going away from you, and they measure that, uh, that uh, vibration period out and decide how big the planet is rotating with the star and what is the priority of the, of the one year of this uh, planet. And there's another one uh, which uh, has been used but uh, not very successful uh, to discover the planet. So from that, uh, from 1995 to, uh, to up to now, there are many of planets has been discovered. And if we look at, uh, this is a uh, beginning and 27, 26, 28, 20, uh, no, no, 1992, 23, 24, five, 26. So you can see more and more uh, planet has been discovered, but we have two lines there. One is uh, green, which tells you the, the habitable zone and one is uh, uh, blue, which tell you the size, uh, which should be the Earth-like size. Not too big, but not too small. Too small, it cannot hold atmosphere. Too big, uh, people cannot live on it. The creatures cannot live on it because the gravity is too heavy. So you can see up to 2006, we, we have what we have up to 2012, we have only uh, discovered bigger ones and uh, very close to the home star ones, uh, which means the, the year are too short. It's only 10 days or 20 days, less than 100 days, which, which means the planet is too close to the home star. Uh, if it's far away from home star, it is too big. So you see the distribution of, uh, of the discovered uh, planet by transit method, most of them are discovered by transit method, are uh, too big or, or too close to the home star, which are not the Earth type. So Earth type is in this corner. You see marked by the uh, red box. Why it is that? Because uh, the most important, one of the most important problem is uh, by using transit or ratio velocity method, you can only discover the planet, which the planet disk, or we call it uh, elliptical plane, uh, uh, in your direction. So we call it uh, age on. Only if the age on, uh, the planet system is age on, we can use transit method. If the planet system is face on, it's like in the right, right uh, uh, hand uh, up corner, this one is a face on. If it's a face on, you cannot use transit method and you cannot use a visual velocity method. In fact, the planet system around uh, in our galaxy, in the universe, they can be very every directions. It can be face on, age on, or can be in between. So this is the problem. We missed a lot of them. And if we make a statistics, we can see that all the right ones are discovered by ratio velocity. All the green ones are discovered by transit, which has been used by Kepler 
tests and other uh, missions. So the blue ones are discovered by macro lensing and uh, the earth is still there. You can say earth is still there. There's no suitable method to discover the earth size exoplanet. So this is what we are looking at. The new method, or oh, it's not new method, is the, the approach we are going to use is called astro astrometry. Astrometry is means to making a star measurement in a very, very precise way. So this is the, uh, the method. Uh, I, I will show you. The home star is marked by, by a red star, and the yellow star are the background star. And uh, the, the red star is what we are looking at uh, in the middle and close by, and all the reference stars, we select them, which are far away stars. They are not moving so much. So then we measure the distance between the home star, uh, between target star and the background star. And uh, from time to time, we look at again, look at again. And you can say from the uh, time domain uh, image, you can say the home star is vibrating. Is uh, the, the distance is changing all the time because there are planets rotating around them. And if we do a Fourier transform of this time domain uh, noise, we found bingo, there's only one um, bar there. That is the uh, rotating period of our, of our target star. So I have three minutes, I will go a little bit faster. So, which means that if we look at the home star, the target star from time to time, and here is the simulation of 50 times and 100 times and uh, 200 times, and we get more and more accurate uh, evidence of the period of the, how, how many, how long time for one year of this planet. If there are three planets, we will find three bars there after Fourier transformation. So it sounds very good, but there's a lot of technologies uh, to develop this telescope. I mentioned only one difficulties. This one difficulty is the imaging chip. We use CMOS. And this CMOS, if they give you a picture, it's very nice. But if you look at details, the, sens the sensors on the chip are not so uniform. So you can see the image in the, in, in the middle. And if we, we, all the error comes from that. So if you look at the image of the left bottom, and the, the blue bars are the signals coming up from the sensors, but what we need is the right line. So this is called centroroiding. We have to use a method to calculate the center, where is the uh, right curve, the center of the right curve, and it goes to one, one to minus five, 10 to the minus five pixels of the CMOS. And to use uh, also uh, uh, optical, a calibration method to calibrate all this ununiform and to get a very precise centroid. So this is only one of the technology. Now the mission is under development. It is called uh, CHES. It's close by uh, habitable exoplanet search mission. And it has a, a 1.2 meter camera and it will be launched at L2 point and we are looking only at nearby target stars. And uh, for five years lifetime, we can look at those 100 candidates many, many times, 100 times. And then to do a Fourier transform to get all the curves, uh, all the orbit period from that. So this is called astrometry method and uh, looking at habitable home star. So this is a, all about what I'm going to tell you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Wu, for the very insightful keynote. Now I'm very happy to introduce our third speaker, Professor Monica Lendl. Active as a professional astronomer in the field of exoplanet detection since 2007, Professor Lendl obtained a PhD in, in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of Geneva in 2014. She subsequently has been involved in numerous international collaborations in Belgium, Germany, as well as Austria. And she has also led several 
or observational campaigns at the largest and most advanced ground-based telescopes. Today, she is an assistant professor at the University of Geneva, where she heads an SNF um, Excellence Research Group on time variable phenomena in exoplanet atmospheres, as well as manages the scientific program of the KEOPS space mission. Professor Lendl, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so let me share my slides. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so I will talk to you about the uh, discovery of extrasolar planets and their characterization. And I will make a specific uh, focus on the results that we've recently had from the KOPS mission that uh, Nick already told us about earlier today. Uh, the motivation for the research that we're doing really is this, right? Our solar system, our home, uh, we know life has developed on at least one of the planets in the solar system. So the big question we're asking ourselves is out there in the universe, in this beautiful, beautiful sky of many stars, are there other planets like the Earth that possibly would have uh, allowed for conditions similar to the Earth and life to arise there? Um, now, we're not quite there yet. Um, but we're going there, right? So we're now searching for extrasolar planets, but this is not an easy thing. So we often tend to forget a little bit about how, how difficult this really is, what we're trying to do. Um, just an analogy that I like a lot is we're actually trying to detect a candle in the case of a large Jupiter-sized planet or a firefly that is sitting right next to a bright lighthouse. And to make things worse, we're actually doing this across Switzerland. So it's as if we're here in Geneva are observing the lighthouse with a candle and the firefly all the way um, out in, near the, the Bodensee on the other side of the country. But this has been done um, and my previous speakers have already introduced this many times now. Uh, in, in 1995, uh, Michel Maillot and Didier Coulot looked at the star in the Pegasus constellation and they observed the radial movement of the star by looking at the precise position of lines in the stellar spectrum. And by doing this, they could observe the actual movement of the star in reflex to the, to the existence of a planet in the system. We call this the radial velocity method. This is the curve they obtained. You can see here simply the variation of this radial velocity component against the orbital phase of the planet. Now, what was really striking at this point is that actually the uh, planet that they found corresponded to a massive object with a period of only 4.2 days. This is quite surprising because this is, means the object is very close into the star. Uh, the period of the Earth is, of course, 365 days. But Many further um, detections using the same technique and the transit technique that I'll come to uh, were obtained subsequently, so that today there is absolutely no doubt anymore about the existence of exoplanets. And of course, this discovery then led to the award of the Nobel Prize to these two researchers. So here we are, the solar system. So where does this first exoplanet actually fit in? Well, it fits into the very, very inner uh, part of a, of a system. So here you see uh, 51 peg B on the same scale as the solar system objects, and you can see it's much closer into its host star uh, than even Mercury. And on top of that, with only having radial velocity, well, we couldn't actually tell all that much about the planet. We knew the line of sight velocity, but not the orbital inclination, so that only revealed the planetary minimum mass. There was absolutely no knowledge about the planetary size, so it might actually be a much larger, lower density object, or, and that seemed a bit more likely, a much smaller, very dense object. So in order to find out actually a lot more about these planets, what we need to do is we need to measure their sizes. And this is where the transit method comes in. The transit method is illustrated here in this animation very easy to understand, the planet passes in front of the star. And as it does that, it obscures part of the stellar disk and the system appears uh, fainter for a short uh, period of time. 
Of course, we then observe repeated transits uh, to measure the period of the planet. And of course, the size of the transit depth uh, of this dip that corresponds to the size of the planet. So the, the, the conjunction of these two techniques really tells us already a lot about the, the exoplanets in question. It tells us the radii, it tells us the mass, and with that, it tells us the density and allows us to constrain uh, already a lot about the composition of the planets. So I already said that actually planet detection really took off. In fact, I like to call this the exoplanet gold rush. You can here have a little animation about the number of exoplanets that were discovered um, in the mass and period plane. And you can see that in the beginning, what was discovered were all of uh, this large population of very massive planets, Jupiter-like planets. And then as time went on in around 2010, also thanks to the launch of the Kepler satellite, there were a lot of lower mass or smaller planets discovered. And we're really starting to fill up this full parameter space. So this is where we are today. And so the, the key thing that I'd like you to take away is that there are really a lot of planets uh, down in the parameter space uh, around uh, between one and let's say 20 Earth masses. And these planets exist already at very short periods. So these are objects that really we don't have at all in our solar system and they're quite a mystery. So uh, we'd like to understand what exoplanets are made of, right? We could imagine different sorts of compositional structures. We can imagine gas giants with a small core. We could possibly even imagine a gas giant without a core. Uh, we can imagine um, planets with a much larger core and a thinner gas envelope. Uh, we can imagine ice giants analog to a Neptune or Uranus in our solar system. Uh, or we could imagine an ocean planet with a rocky core and a large water envelope. And then, of course, the, the thing we would all like to discover is a rocky planet with a small, thin atmosphere like the Earth. So what we need to do in order to understand what the possible structures of planets are, uh, we need to measure precise radii. And this is where the KOP space mission comes in. Now I'm going to repeat a couple of things that Professor Thomas said earlier. Uh, KOPS is a mission led in partnership between ESA and Switzerland. It's a consortium of 11 European countries. You can see their contributions down here. Uh, it's a 30 meter space telescope. So it's a really uh, fairly simple um, method. It's just a single telescope, no filters and optical passband. And it's really optimized to do one thing and that is to obtain extreme precision brightness measurements to observe highly precise transit light curves. Um, it was launched uh, in 2019 and the science observations commenced in March, 2020. There are just a couple of images uh, from CHAOPS as it was getting ready to be launched. Uh, down here on the right, you can see uh, the actual assembled spacecraft just before it was ready to be shipped off to launch. And you can see that the whole satellite is about the size of a person. So we're not talking about anything the size of the Hubble Space Telescope here. Um, then we were launched, I already said, uh, in uh, 2019 uh, on board a Soyuz rocket from uh, Kourou. And the orbit of Chaos is just going over the terminator of Earth. So uh, this allows Chaos to actually always look away from the, from the sun and point towards, of course, the night side. Now, because we're in a low Earth orbit, this also means that we sometimes uh, can't point to the star. We want to look at through all of the orbits simply because the Earth is in the way. And that sometimes leads to some um, slight gaps in the light curves that you will see. So in case you're wondering where those come from, that's the reason. OK, so now I'd like to show you a couple of highlights from chaos that we've had in the last year and a half. Uh, I'd like to first uh, show you a system called Nutulupi. So Nutulupi is a naked eye star. You can actually see it with your own eyes. Uh, it's magnitude about five. About five. Uh, you can see it from the Earth. And this planet was known to host two transiting small planets that were discovered by the test mission. So the goal of our chaos observation was to observe the system, measure very precise radii for these two planets, uh, and then characterize their compositions. 
So what we did, we observed first three transits of the inner planet, planet B. And then we went on, we observed the transit of planet C and then uh, a double transit. So a transit of planet uh, C and before we called part of a transit of planet B. And then we wanted to get another transit of planet C and this is what we actually observed. So we uh, saw the, the expected transit, but then we saw something else in the light curve. And it uh, actually turns out that the, the dip in the light curve, the extra dip that we're seeing here, corresponded to the predicted transit time of a long period planet detected previously by radial velocities. So in fact, this detection puts a third planet on the uh, transit plot of the star, uh, planet D. And okay, we can, we can add it here. Um, and so new to loopy D is the first long period low mass planet uh, known to transit a naked eye star. Uh, we now have a planetary system with three planets with measure, measured compositions. And this system is really becoming a benchmark system to study the atmospheres of cool, small exoplanets. Promised you something about the composition, so here we go. Uh, this is the compositional distribution of uh, the Nutulupi system. So we see on top the uh, two outer planets uh, in the different colors. These are the different compositional layers that we've modeled for these planets. You can see they have, we expect them to have large rocky core in the center and then envelopes of water and um, low uh, mean molecular weight, so hydrogen and helium envelopes on top. So those outer two planets uh, work very well with compositions that do have a substantial outer envelope and also a substantial um, water composition still. So they're clearly not Earth-like planets. Now the innermost planet, it's also not really Earth-like because it's very hot, but it only has a very thin water layer on top of a rocky core from the way we understand it. Okay, moving on. The next system I'd like to show you is TOI-178. Now TOI-178 uh, was suspected actually to be a very, very curious planetary system. There were three known um, transiting planets where two of these planets appeared to have very, very similar orbits. So the only way really to explain this was to actually have a Trojan system with one planet orbiting and then a second planet located actually in its Lagrange point. And so they would share the same orbital region around the star. So what we did with KOPS, we wanted to characterize this system in greater detail and actually understand whether this Trojan hypothesis could be real. We took the telescope and we stared at the object for 11 days to see whether we could actually catch two of these 10 day uh, period Trojan planets. Now, what we actually saw was very interesting. Well, we didn't really see the Trojan planets, but what we saw was a lot of different uh, features. And so we saw first a uh, transit feature corresponding to a longer period. Uh, then we saw this very small transit feature corresponding to a very small short period planet. Uh, we saw a deep feature corresponding to a larger, longer period planet. Um, and then another one at a mid period. So this actually means that there was previously some confusion about the different transit signals because at the precision that was actually available, they kind of all looked more or less like each other. But with KOPS, we could actually resolve them and attribute them to different planets. So this is the system that we've observed. Now with KOPS, we've resolved it. And actually, we're now looking at seven individual planets. And they all, I mean, look at the periods here. They all have really short periods. They're just essentially orbiting almost next to each other. Um, it's a compact system. And the very interesting thing also about the the periods is that they have all but the innermost planets, they have period ratios that are integers of each other. So they're forming a resonant chain of planetary orbits. And um, here's just an illustration that shows you how dense the planetary system actually is. Putting this now into context of the solar system, just to illustrate here, we would actually need to fit the TOI 179 planetary system all the way far inside of the orbit of Mercury. So all of these planets, they orbit inside uh, 
15 astronomical units. Moving on, uh, because our time's limited, uh, I'd like to show you a slightly different um, type of science that we've also been doing with CHAOPS, and this relates to the characterization of the planetary atmosphere. So in this case, uh, we looked at a system that's illustrated here on the left. That system is called WAS-189, and actually the host star is an, is an A-type star, so it is much larger than the Sun, and it's orbited by a hot Jupiter planet, so a close-in period gas giant. And this time, we didn't actually observe during transit, but we observed when the planet was passing behind the star. When the planet passes behind the star, the light emitted by the planet is blocked, and by the size of the flux decrease corresponding to this light that is blocked, we can measure the, the temperature coming from the planet, or actually the, the, the light emitted by the planet, which we then can translate into a temperature. So we've done this. And so what you can see here is actually this Chaos measurement of the detection of the occultation of was 189 b uh, The precision of the measurement is about five parts per million. So here, I've already mentioned, we can actually use this measurement to calculate the uh, temperature of the planet, which corresponds to about 3,200 uh, Celsius. Now, we did another detection on this planet. We also observed the transit, and this is quite curious. If you squint your eyes a little bit, you can see that the transit is asymmetric. Now, this asymmetry comes from the fact that the star is, in fact, a little bit oblate because it's a fast rotating A star. And so we use this to actually constrain the planetary orbit and its arrangement around the star. The planet actually goes over the stellar poles. Now, with this, I'll just show you a couple of uh, hints of where, what's next in exoplanet science. And we're now studying hot planets and gas giants. James Webb is ready to launch, more or less. And uh, we will then move on to Plato and uh, Ariel later on. And eventually, we will study the atmospheres of terrestrial planets um, with the next generation of space telescopes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lendl, for the fascinating insights. Um, and last but not least, I am delighted to introduce our fourth and final speaker, um, Professor Shengfei Liu who is an associate professor at the School of Physics and Astronomy, as well as the Chinese Space Station Telescope Science Center for the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area of Sun Yat-sen University. Prior to this, Professor Liu obtained a PhD in astrophysics from Peking University in 2013, before subsequently working as a postdoctoral research at the University of California, Santa Cruz from 2013 to 2015, as well as Rice University from 2015 to 2018. Professor Liu is in particular interested in theoretical astrophysics, which he works on with the aid of computational simulations, and is also interested in this context in understanding how planets are assembled, as well as to uncover the fate of these planetary systems. Professor Liu, the floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, let me share my screen. Uh, is it working? Yes. Uh, which, just a second. Sorry, I think I made some mistake. Yes. Okay, without further ado, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depends on which time zone you are in. Uh, thank you very much for the organizers who gave me this chance. I'm very honored to give this uh, very short introduction about plan formation. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, three particular stages, namely the birth, growth, and death of the planetary systems. So let me first move into the uh, historical perspective. The so-called nebula hypothesis is probably the most widely accepted scenario that explains the formation and evolution of the solar system. It was proposed a few hundred years ago. Actually, it was developed by a, a German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, in the 18th century. But interestingly, if you look at the modern view of this scenario, it's remarkably similar to what it was originally proposed. So in this scenario, the solar system 
was formed from a gaseous disk that has a lot of dust. So the dust gradually grow, become bigger and bigger. They form the cores of planets and they start to create gas. So eventually they become the planets we see in the solar system. So that's, that nebula is also called a protoplanet disk, which is a cradle of the solar system and many other young planetary systems. So in this schematic diagram, I would like to show you the simplest case, how to understand the structure of our solar system. So we know in the solar system, the uh, terrestrial planets lie the interior in the solar system. And in the outskirts, the uh, gaseous giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn, the furthest are those icy giant planets, Neptune and Uranus. So why this is why this configuration is formed? So the reason is simple, because the temperature drops from the interior to the to the out part. In Switzerland, I, I bet you like go to uh, ski a lot, right? So you know there's a snow line. So it's the same case in the solar nebula. There are certain point, a certain point, the temperature drops below zero. So the water, be, what, the water froze.s So beyond that snow line, the water become solid. Within the snow line, the water is in gaseous phase. So that's why in the out part of the solar system, there are a lot of material provided by the uh, water ices. This sufficient to supply promotes the uh, formation of. Uh, massive planets like uh, like Jupiter and Saturn. So that's the simplest and uh, scenario of the formation of the solar system. Let me remind you one interesting fact. So our star, our sun, uh, is already about uh, four billion years ago, four billion years old, right? But this protoplanet disk phase is only about two weeks. If, I, if we assume, if we compare the, the star's life into a human being's life. So it's a, very, it's a very short period of time. How do we observe that? How do we understand the formation and the birth of the planets? Fortunately, we have a lot of stars nearby. So we can try to find those stars in the baby stages. So we, we are looking for planets around these young stars. So one particular powerful instrument is the Atacama Large Millimeter and the Sub Millimeter Array, uh, ARMA, is by far the most expensive uh, ground uh, instrument, instrument. So there are 66 antennas that makes up this uh, whole interferometer. So each of the interferometer is uh, huge. It's, uh, you can see from this picture. And this site, the ARMA locates is in, nor in Northern Chile, is in the uh, mountain area. If I zoom in, you can see it's here in the, oops, the network is a little bit slow. <laughs> well, uh, it will show up eventually. Anyway, so with this instrument, with this instrument, people are able to find many substructures around young stars. So, for example, here are, is a mosaic image of these substructures around many young stars. You see these rings and arcs. Let's take a look of a, a one particular case. So I'm showing two images. They are remarkably similar to each other, right? If I'm asking you which one is real, which one do you pick? So, so I may actually make this a comparison simpler because on the left-hand side, you can see a lot of noises. So that's the signature of the observation, right? You see these jitters in the uh, exoplanet searches. Uh, on the right-hand side, it's a model generated by computers. On the left-hand side, it's a real armor observation. So these two images are remarkably similar, which means we are understanding the physics behind this picture. So what you are seeing is the dust distribution around the young star. So what causes that? So it's basically the interaction between the 
unseen planet with a gaseous disk that has a lot of dust. So from this, from this uh, sim numerical simulation, you see the planet is orbiting around the young star and it's also interacting with the gaseous disk. So with the planet growing bigger and bigger, it carves a, a very deep a ring uh, at its location. So eventually this, this dark ring becomes this, this gap you seen in the previous picture. So, but this planet cannot be seen, right? So that's due to the limitation of a current observation. But in the future, with new, with next generation instrument, we may be able to see this planet formation in real time. So here I'm showing a picture indicating a planet is forming uh, around the young star. So uh, this, so this, this, uh, this dot represent a Jupiter mass, a Jupiter mass planet, and this is a sun-like star. So with the next generation interferometer, we may be able to see the uh, forming planets orbiting the young star directly. Okay, let's move on to the next stage. Uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to show you some interesting uh, research I've been doing about the growth of planets. So in previous section, we already know that planet formation is basically the history of dust. So the planets grow from the dusty disk. So the dust grow bigger and bigger. Eventually, they form the cores of planets, or the or the terrestrial planets is basically made of the dust. So, which means that the interior structure of planets tell the history of how these planets are formed. Unlike extrasolar planets, we can only see the radius, we can only get the radius and uh, the mass. In the solar system, we are able to send uh, spacecraft which can orbit, in, which can orbit these planets, measure the gravitational field. And we can use data to interpret its interior structure. So based on the standard theory, we infer that Jupiter has uh, tiny compact core, which is made of metals. By metal, I mean elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. But surprisingly, Juno's data suggests that Jupiter instead has a very extended dilute core, which extends almost more than half of the Jupiter's radius. So this, this finding is, uh, is shocking and is challenging the, the prime formation theory. So how do we understand this, this uh, major question? So we propose that the childhood of planets could be very violent. So what causes that? It could be a, a giant impact in the early phases of planet formation because we already see that in the protoplanet disk observation, there are many planets forming at the same time. So when Jupiter is formed, there are many planetary embryos. So Jupiter's growth could eventually perturb nearby planetary embryos. So this perturbation may eventually lead to a, a catastrophic event that young Jupiter could swallow another baby planet. And this merger will lead to an interior structure that is very similar to what Juno has observed. But this is an open question. If, if it's not, maybe there's some other mechanism which requires a major modification of the theory of plant formation. Okay, in the last few uh, slides, I'm going to talk about the death of planets. Before doing that, let me show you a picture of Sirius. So Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. You can see that easily with your naked eye. So it's a binary star. So the, the, the main star is like, it's a little bit heavier than the sun. And the, the secondary is small, but their masses are comparable. So the secondary is, is comparable to the size of the earth, but the mass is comparable to a star. So what is that? So this is a so-called white dwarf. 
So why do of the cell remnants after the central hydrogen helium is consumed? So it's basically a evolved star. So what makes that interesting is because more than 95% of stars in our Milky Way will eventually become white dwarfs. And we already know that there's so many planetary systems around sun-like stars. So eventually, this planetary system will face the fate of their whole stars becoming evolved stars. And this will cause a catastrophe event. So the structure of this white dwarf are quite simple. In the center is composed of carbon oxygen core, and uh, it has an atmosphere made of hydrogen and helium. Because the white dwarf is so small, it's comparable to the size of Earth, but the gravity, but the mass is comparable to the sun. So the surface gravity is very large. So you cannot have any element heavier than hydrogen and helium. It's like you're throwing a rock onto the lake. So observation finds a lot of metals in the atmosphere of white dwarfs. So that means these white dwarfs are creating metals as, as, all the time. So why, what causes the accretion? This material comes from the existing planetary uh, system, right? So that's, that's been a very hot topic in the recent years. And we are being observing these signatures, the planetary, planetary bodies around white dwarfs in many cases. So one particular interesting is, we know that in the solar system, we have the outcrowd Kepler belt, which has a lot of uh, comets, right? So in order to deliver this planetary material towards a white dwarf, you need to shrink the radial distances by a lot. By a lot, I mean really a lot, because the old cloud is at a location about 10,000 AU, but the white dwarf is only has a size that comparable to the earth. In order to accrete those primary material, you have to go very deep, very close to the surface of white dwarf. And this white dwarf strong gravity can tore apart this primary material. And this material eventually can be circularized and the influence of white of strong gravitational field, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, magnetic field. But this picture is still highly simplified. We do not understand a lot of uh, details. And this, this understanding that this uh, mechanism will has a huge impact to the future of our solar system because our sun will eventually evolve into a white dwarf. Okay, since the time is running, I'm going to uh, stop here. So this is marks the end of my talk, but the end is the, uh, I put a quote here because this end is barely not the end, it barely scratches the surfaces of uh, primary studies. There are many questions I didn't even talk about. So this cartoon showing the solar system in the context of a Milky Way, each red dot represents the discovered uh, the, 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 the exoplanetary uh, harboring system. So you see, we, we are just started to learn our neighborhood. We are going to go deeper and deeper. And this journey will lead us more and more interesting discoveries. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Liu, for your insightful presentation. Um, we are already almost at the time limit, but we will still answer a couple of questions in the Q&A section. Um, if all the speakers could quickly put on their um, cameras, we can then switch to a gallery view so that everybody can see you live as well. Um, the first one from the Q&A box was um, regarding existing international frameworks um, for exoplanet discovery and exploration. So the question is, um, if any of the speakers can talk about existing international frameworks on exoplanet discovery and exploration. I would suggest that we maybe start with Professor Thomas um, to get the European um, insight and then maybe Professor Wu, you can also add um, a bit from the Chinese side. 
Well, I suppose the, the um, networks are, there are networks of groups that are working in, in, in the field. Um, most people know everybody else that's working in the field. It's not as if um, we have um, hundreds of thousands of people that are working in these, uh, in, the, in these areas. And there's, a, a, you know, there are collections of, of uh, there are sites where people are uh, preparing um, collections of, of um, planets that have, that have been discovered and so on. Um, but also there's, co there's cooperation between teams, for example, between uh, the KEOPS team and the TESS team from, from NASA, for example. Um, and so there are, there are international collaborations and like many international collaborations, they're on the basis of people sort of saying, well, you know, it'd be good if we could do this. Why don't I get in contact? And this type of networking is, is, is quite common. Within, um, within the European domain, um, we have a lot of collaborations with groups, whether it's from Berlin or in Marseille and so on. And maybe, I don't know, from um, that, that's in the space area. Maybe Monica could say a few words as well about the uh, um, about and ground-based observations, for example. Yeah, of course. So in ground-based observations on the European side, the main uh, the main facility to look at is the the uh, ESO, the European Southern Observatory, which is a, a large uh, ground-based facility that. Uh, hosts some of the most uh, advanced telescopes and that's uh, co-funded by a set of European uh, countries, but we also have international partners in ESO, uh, such as Australia and, uh, and Brazil. Um, so I think that's to add on the, on the ground-based side, yeah. Many thanks. Um, Professor Wu, could you okay. also maybe provide a Chinese insight? Yes, this area is uh, is a very uh, is quite new. Uh, it's uh, since uh, the nineties, and uh, it's developed very fast. So uh, uh, so far, it is a very open scientific er area. Uh, people are collaborating and exchange data, uh, which are, are very open. So uh, the Chinese scientists are participating in international um, conference and uh, proposing. Uh, uh, project missions together, so there's no generally no problem, and the uh, the people are coming from different areas, from astronomers, from uh, uh, because we are looking for habitable planet, so it's also coming from planet uh, scientists, uh, which are more connected with the Earth, uh, atmosphere and uh, magnetospheres and so on. And uh, there is an international uh, organization is called COSPAR. And COSPAR has uh, several commissions uh, are working for that. So people are coming from Commission E, Commission D, uh, Commission B. Uh, Commission B is a more planet, Commission A is more Earth, and Commission D is more, uh, Commission C is more atmosphere, Commission D is more, uh, uh, space physics, plasma physics, commission E is more astronomer. So people are working together. So there's uh, uh, international collaborations uh, in this area. And COSPAR is the major organization to help people. Thank you very much for your insight. Um, Professor Liu, do you have anything to add? Not at the moment. If, if not, I will ask a final question before we wrap up this, uh, this webinar. Um, obviously, exoplanet research is interesting as such. I think everybody's been fascinated by it at one point or another. But of course, also, it's interesting because it gives us new insights on our own solar system and our own planet. Um, there was a recent article also by the University of Geneva where they developed, they used AI techniques, essentially, to... Um, which, which was used for transit methods to detect exoplanets via the transit method, where they were able to apply it to the Earth in order to be able to detect illegal dumping. Um, specifically, now that we have all these talks about climate change, do you have any examples maybe of techniques or methods um, that you're using to characterize these, uh, these atmospheres on these exoplanets, which may also come in useful for uh, understanding more about our own climate and environment around us? Maybe Professor Liu, in case you have insights from the computational um, simulation side. Uh, yeah, uh, so from computational simulations, 
uh, it's very difficult to study the atmosphere uh, from a, a global simulation. If you want to study the atmospheric simulation, you probably do some localized. You just study a very thin layer. Uh, but you raise a very interesting point. Try to link the uh, solar system study and the extra solar uh, research, extra solar panels researches. So I, I didn't talk too much in my uh, presentation. Actually, there are, there, there are very many links because, for example, why planets migrate in the exoplanet system, but why there's so little migration in the solar system? And there are many other comparisons we need to understand. So I, I think the solar system serve uh, a very good test uh, for us to understand the physics, but the exosolar, extrasolar planets and also the young star, uh, uh, young protoplanet disk gave us a great opportunity to broaden our view. We should not be restrained by the solar system cases alone. Thank you. Thank you very much to... for your insight. Um, yes, of course, if you have anything yeah, to add. I just wanted to make a, make a remark with respect to this. Um, until fairly recently, so that, uh, uh, maybe a decade or a decade and a half ago, the Martian atmosphere was actually being used to test um, Earth climate models and Earth GCMs. And so uh, there, there is interaction there that can take place. Um, it's merely that people, at the present time, things are still relatively new. And um, it takes time for these ideas and concepts to be thought about. Um, but I, I'm absolutely, absolutely certain that with the amount of effort that's being put into um, uh, exoplanet studies, that these types of synergies will be, will be appearing more and more frequently. And uh, the example that you gave, Niels, was just one of those. Thank you very much for your input. Um, do any of the other speakers, Professor Lendl or Professor Wu, have anything to add? No, I don't have, no. All right, in that case, due to time constraints, I think we will conclude this webinar at this point. Um, but I would like to thank Professors Thomas, Wu, Lendl, and Liu again. Thank you so much for joining us, for your time, for your deep insights. And of course, to you, dear audience, for joining us. Um, and of course, also for submitting the questions. Um, if you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to send them to us. We will then forward them on to the speakers um, and then of course, provide you with the response. Um, please also feel free to follow us on all of our social media platforms. You can see them um, on the slide behind you. Um, and yeah, you're of course also more than welcome to yeah, ask any other questions that you may have about the Swiss ERI network as well. Again, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any further questions, you know where to reach us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you.